welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Beyond Kicking and Punching. We've got a very special guest with us today here in Salt Lake City. Actually, he's out in California, but he's here. We've got an activity that's going to be going on all day. But we've got so much to talk about this individual. And I say individual because he is a special human being. He's done a lot of things in, in, in his life, of which we're going to be covering. But um, I'll be asking some of the questions, and you probably will have some too. And if you can send that telepathic message over the line, then I can get it, and I can get it on, 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 over to him. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us today Grandmaster Ted Sumner. All right, so everybody, you know, we give a slight hand of applause and we're going to do all that one. But I got some questions to ask Mr. Ted Sumner. I'm just going to say Ted, okay? That's um, fine. I mean, we, we're on a personal base, but you know, he's a grandmaster. Right? He's a grandmaster for some reason, okay? Um, and we're going to be talking about his book. And if you can see it right here, that's uh, it's Ted, you see? It's called Deep Cover. Uh, deep Cup Cover or Deep Cover Cup. Yep. Right. And uh, and you know what? This one, he looks, he looks like a baby face. I mean, really young looking. And maybe this is the reason why. <laughs> but anyway, right? Maybe. Yeah. yeah okay. Precisely. Uh, um, you know, questions that I have for people ask me, yeah. You know, I just say, uh, you know, Ted looks so young. Um, uh, how old were you when you started the martial arts? Um, started Kempo at the age of 13. Under? Uh, Alan Jim Tracy. Uh, in California? Yes, they had just uh, they had just uh, opened their school in San Jose, uh -huh. and um, I was um, uh, very much into boxing before that. And my eighth grade school teacher was also a pugilist, Dave Cardens, and I stopped by to see him uh, after school. I was I was in high school at the time. Uh, to talk about some boxing technique and he said no 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 you gotta you gotta see what I'm doing now and he went over some tempo techniques and that was it I had to have it I had to learn it on the Allen Jim Tracy yes there there were two schools in San Jose at the time well three you could study judo uh, with the guys at San Jose State they had they had their own school um, or you could uh, study Kangak Wan under Bob Babbage or the Tracys had just opened their school it was about a month old. That, that was the first school, they, the commercial school they opened up. No, they had one in San Francisco. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they had their San Francisco school on Ocean Avenue. They'd opened the year before. And then they opened the school in San Jose. Uh, then one in Sacramento. And then, of course, you know, everything after that. Uh, so you've been with them ever since. Yeah? Pretty much. Um, now, you know, I know that um, you, you've learned a lot of things. And I, 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 and I know that, you know, being Kempo based, it's very eclectic and yes. innovative, so you become creative. And I like to say that people that, if you understand, um, he came out of the the uh, temple system, right? Yes. And uh, the the style of temple uh, that you were, uh, came up was uh, Tracy's temple. But, yeah, Ed Parker. Ed, Ed Parker's uh, 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 style, I would say. Yes. And the um, and the. The method you're teaching is actually your method when you're teaching these students, right? It, it, yes, things creep in that I've learned over the years and uh, help to, uh, I think, uh, make it more efficient. There you go. Because now what you're doing is, when you took it, you went from system, style, method to expression, right? Exactly. And you know, it's really neat, guys, because you have to understand that um, I feel, and a lot of people feel in the martial arts, that Tempo has been really the sort of like the premier in the United States for people being very innovative and creative in their thinking. I mean, you take a look at the fast hands that Tempo has and the innovation that Ed Parker and Jim Tracy and other people within Kaju Tempo has. I mean, it really flourished. So it, it is there. And this is one reason why we have the uh, what we have today. Oh, by the way, folks, yeah, uh, you like what we're doing on the subscription? Subscribe. There, the button. Yeah, the thumbs up here on, and the bell, okay? And, well, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. But, okay, <laughs> uh, we're listening about Ted right now. And, Ted, while we're at it, you know, before we get into that, are you teaching actively now or what? I still teach advanced students, uh, and I teach at events like this. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't have a school anymore. Vance Murakami took over my school, and mm -hmm. he's running it on a regular basis. Vance, 
Yes. He's in there, right? Yes. Right, right. Wow. Uh, he was my number one student. I'm kidding. Now, if you were to put inside your teaching experience, how far does it go back? 40, 50 years? Oh, uh, yes. Well, uh, next, let's see. This October, well, a year from this October, I'll be in it 60 years. Um, and before that, I wrestled, I boxed. Uh, I, I was not a terribly good wrestler. Mm -hmm. When I was at San Jose State, I was able to study judo mm -hmm. with the NCAA champion judo team and get PE credits for it. Mm -hmm. So I took judo every day under Yoshishida, mm -hmm. who was legendary in, in judo. Um, I was about as good in judo as I was in wrestling. But in boxing, I really excelled. And Julie Menendez, who had coached the US Olympic team, uh, was the coach at San Jose State, and he was grooming me to come there and and uh, had a scholarship set up for me. Then somebody got killed in NCAA competition and they eliminated it. Uh, and then that was then uh, uh, about the time I started into Kempo uh, with the Tracy brothers. And uh, they started me teaching when I was 17. So that was around 1967. I know, we, we coming up to the age part. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that's pretty interesting on how you got up to that point. And I'm, I'm going to be jumping around on a lot of things. Sure. My, my head is just spinning about, wow, you know, I got to I gotta try to trap the brain yeah. and, and, as, well, as much as you can. I want to get into the book, which is really exciting. Okay. What, uh, what actually inspired you to write the book? Well, when I teach, I always use uh, personal or borrowed experiences to establish the relevance of what I'm teaching. Mm -hmm and to motivate the student. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes there are things that happen to me and people would tell me, well, you gotta write a book. The problem is this is about police work and policemen don't like other policemen who write books because <laughs> it usually involves, I'm the only honest policeman and everybody else is a pro. Right. <laughs> and they don't like that. Okay. Um, but Mills Crenshaw, who was um, one of Ed Parker's students when he was at Brigham Young University mm -hmm. in the uh, mid fifties, he saw uh, one of my seminars at uh, Jeff Speakman's event in Las Vegas, and he wanted wanted me to write it. He wanted to consult. I said no, so he offered to ghostwrite it. So we we agreed to that, but he couldn't quite catch it. He'd never been undercover. That's a especially deep undercover where you're by yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I started writing. Well, he didn't realize I was an English major in college, and he said, "Well, you write as well as I do." So you write the book and can I edit? And so he edited the book and that's how he kind of pressured me into doing it. How long did it take you to write that book? About a year. You know, people are going to ask, you yeah, um, know, this book here, and you know, if you, you can see this book is the same, like the poster there, right? Um, where can a person get this book? Uh, they can get it on Amazon um, or they can uh, actually email me then I can inscribe it for them if they'd like. Okay. Um, give us your email address. It's, what? it's TLS, my initials, Theodore Leslie Sumner, 1580. That was my badge number. Uh -huh. Easy to remember at yahoo.com. At yahoo.com. That's pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, you know, this one here, I read it, and then you said there was some, uh, you tell it better because you took down with some pretty heavy people. You know? We took down four major cartels. Okay, uh, can you talk about it? Oh, sure. Okay, tell us about it because I want to hear it from you. <laughs> uh, I, I would say probably one of the most impactful things that we did um, was uh, we, we brought down, uh, it was not the mafia so much as it was um, Joe Bonanno's son and Tori Cerrito uh -huh. were trying to get control of all the Toyota, uh, Nissan, the Japanese car market. And uh, so they were selling cars at below wholesale. Mm. And I mean, everybody was getting a deal and they were driving other dealerships out of out of business and seizing it. And we managed to get in the back door on the, on the drug operation there. But uh, I ran afoul of uh, while they were doing that, they ran afoul of, of the uh, United Auto Workers people, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't touch Cerrito or Bonanno, but they sent a hitman out to send a warning. And he went in and uh, he killed, uh, executed one of the, uh, the dealership uh, managers. And uh, 
I run afoul of him shortly after that, and uh, we wound up in a shootout, and uh, I was hit uh, three times, but I managed to to kill him. So, mm -hmm. uh, I came out of that one all right. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of people get into that. You go to post traumatic stress and all that, right? Yeah. Or yeah. they put you on that desk leave. <laughs> no, no, they put me right back to work. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, they uh, they do a, a real quick uh, uh, check to see that it was all legal. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything illegal, and then they put me right back to work. Wow. Um, on a, on another occasion, I mean, when I was a rookie police officer, um, we were on a call this was, uh, in San Jose. In San Jose. And this group uh, had been breaking into Orchard Supply hardware stores by uh, cutting through the door. Uh, they knew that the alarms were set at 22 inches, so they cut at 18. Mm -hmm. Well, the oldest store in town, the alarms were set at 18 inches, and they cut through it. Mm -hmm. So the police were there, so we, we responded over, and uh, the sergeant in charge said, okay, we'll you know, take a position over by the garbage cans. Well, as the sun came up, Somebody made a break for it. An officer engaged him uh, in a running shootout as the guy went under the truck, a truck that was parked there. The officer was trying to reload at the front wheel as the guy crawled out. And I saw him aim. I had the shotgun. I fired. The other officer fired. And the guy limped over dead. And I'd seen my shot, which was double odd buck, kick up about five feet in front of him. So I figured I missed. Mm -hmm. And the other officer, he's jumping up and down and, you know, had parades for him and everything else. And about uh, three months later, I was uh, called into the chief's office and he said, well, they did the autopsy and one of your pellets from your shotgun bounced off the ground, went into his eye, up to the bottom of his skull, into his brain. That's what killed him. Mm. And I said, so, okay, you know, I guess I go on administrative leave and all. He said, no, get back to work. So... But um, they, you know, in those days, they didn't decompress you. They didn't, you didn't get to see a psychiatrist or anything else. You know, you look all right, go back to work. <laughs> so, um, do you attribute your martial arts training for your three survival? Oh, on a daily basis. Uh -huh. On a daily basis. I could not have survived. Uh, so many things happened uh, that, uh, Without martial arts training, I would have been uh, psychologically and mentally uh, unarmed, physically. Uh, it, it just, uh, I attribute my entire existence to martial arts. You know, people, there's a lot of things that's going on. We know we had this convention, which is called the Unified Grand Masters Association of America. And Sam Ellis, uh, the Grand Master Sam Ellis, is the one that's really putting this together and you we're planning on doing this every year and we've got very talented grandmasters such as Grandmaster Ted so what we're doing over here is really doing something to show people that when you come into our events here the Unified Grandmasters Association you begin to learn because what's happening is just that Grandmaster Ted along with his students is sharing the knowledge as well as other grandmasters to make and progress the martial arts because the martial arts has has somehow in some areas just stagnated and and when it you no know, i'm not saying stagnated stagnated in the sense that the traditional but then when you get into the temple association the people are so innovative and they begin to 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 learn from each other so it's it's what, what we call unified and we'd like to let you know about this about what we have here so a lot of the information by the way you see uh we, we're going to be posting it and it's going to be in, in the, the thing that we do, which is called the International Kaju Kenbo Association, IKA.com. People can register and find out all the information on it, as well as getting the information on TED. Now, TED's got a very unique group, and I think that that already is very inspirational and learning. I mean, we could go on for hours talking about it, but we don't have that kind of time. So what it is, is that we're leaving, we're leaving you also knowing that this is a man that has done it and walked and talked the talk. So, you know, um, you got anything inspirational that you want to, I know they're just stunned. I mean, you can go all kinds of- Oh things. yeah, I can tell you all kinds of stories. Okay, let's go for it. I mean, well, if you want to hear, I mean, things things that happen, I mean, but um, the, the, the main thing, not only did martial arts help me in uh, 
in uh, the dangerous work, uh, undercover. And like you say, I looked young. Uh, <laughs> when I was uh, 26, I could pass for 16 or 17. So my first assignment undercover in narcotics was they, they were getting a lot of pressure, the city council and the police department about where the drugs were coming from that were going into the high schools. So they took me, because I could pass for a high school kid, and one other officer, and they, they just stuck us in the high schools. They said, you'd be working alone, so but you're going to be buying from high school kids, so it shouldn't be dangerous. I got into the high schools and found out I was buying from, I was buying from parolees. I, I located two, two guys who were wanted for murder that they couldn't find. Who were hanging around a high school selling drugs to kids. Uh -huh. uh, this is the kind of stuff that was going on. And so it was very successful. And uh, so they decided to continue it. It was unprecedented for an undercover officer to work alone like that. And they just left me out there for three more years until... Uh, Senior, until you graduated? <laughs> I graduated from high school, finally. I, I, knew, I knew I'd get that degree sooner or later. But um, the, the things that I learned in martial arts is, is uh, uh, has a lot to do also with the ability to concentrate. Uh, I was able to get through college, uh, got two master's degrees and a PhD, and that requires a great deal of discipline and concentration. This is what I learned in the martial arts. Uh, what I based my doctoral dissertation on was how it vaults me. And that was because the Tracy brothers, every Saturday we had a class on how to teach. And it was all on how to teach adults. Mm -hmm. And you know this, in the martial arts, we've been way ahead of the curve for the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. We've been teaching and academia is just catching up. Mm -hmm. So when I was in, in the doctoral program, I was way ahead of the professors. They were asking me about, well, how do you do this? How does this work? And uh, Because we've been doing it in the martial arts for so many years. They never knew you were going to call it. Right? Well, I didn't talk about that in yeah, school, yeah. you know. At, um, they, they, if you're going to enter formal academia, they're not real pro police, right, so right. you don't want to. Yeah. Martial arts, I did talk yeah. about that because uh, what you're doing is you're, you're taking a position and it's based very much on who you are and what your personal experience is. And um, I found that my greatest personal identity is as a teacher of the martial arts. Um, any of the other things I've done in life pale in comparison. Mm -hmm. Now with the internet, uh, I, I, I didn't go a week where I don't get a, an email from some student I taught years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, it, it tells me, you know, I've been very successful, this and that. I couldn't have done it without what you taught. You know, the discipline that you instilled. I, I uh, part of my research when I was in the doctoral program, I, they wanted to know about teaching women. See? Mm -hmm. And I went back and I went through my women students and I went and interviewed them. And the ones that made black belt, I asked them, I said, a lot of women quit. What is it that made you keep going? Because I know this gets tough. And their answer <laughs> was always, I hated you. And I wasn't <laughs> going to let you make me quit. Okay, whatever works. <laughs> I had no idea, but I had an impact. Right. And they did it. They made it. And... They don't. They don't hate me anymore, and they're they're grateful for what they were able to accomplish with what I was able to give them. If you had someone come up to you and say, "Yeah, you know, I want to learn martial arts," or uh, uh, "What should I look for in an instructor in school?" What would you advise them on how to do it? Well, there's a lot of different styles. I would say find a style that offers effective self-defense, and that would mean a school that. Um, doesn't talk a lot about rules and limitations. What we always talked about with the Tracy brothers were the complete doing away with limitations. Um, like I say, I, I wrestled, I did judo, I boxed. A bigger, stronger, better wrestler always beat me. A bigger, stronger, better boxer always beat me. But when I got into Kempo, I can find a thousand ways to beat you because we don't have any rules. You know, you, well, in boxing, you can't hit him in the back of the head. Right. That's one of the first things we do. We you go for we, it. <laughs> and, and, and we even have techniques where we stand in front of the guy and hit him in the back of the head. You know, try that one. 
Right. So it it was all about. So I would say it's all about not so much what you can do, but elimination of what you can't do. If if they offer you an effective uh, self defense system with that can accommodate and adapt to any situation because there's no guarantee you're going to be fighting on a mat mm -hmm. in a room where there's there's um you know room to maneuver i i when i was 50 years old i had a, a young man come into my school he was an mma fighter and he wanted to talk and then this and that and he was trying to learn and and finally he tells me well let's spar well i'm 50 years old you're 25 okay so all he did was try to shoot in i mean i could I could have written, I could have phoned it in, you know. I mean, I knew exactly what he was going to do. And it was very simple to knock him out. And finally he said, well, you know, I, you know, I had a headache. And he says, uh, can we start on the ground? I said, start on the ground? No fight starts on the ground except maybe me and my wife when we're still in bed, you know. And uh, I said, you oh, you want to start on the ground? Yeah, I want to see how my technique is. He said, okay. I said, uh, come with me. And I walked, grabbed a Coke bottle, walking out of the school into the parking lot and I threw it on the ground, I broke it and I pulled my pants down, urinated all over it and I told him, lay down. <laughs> what are you talking about? I said, every time I've had to go to the ground and, and it was mostly as a police officer, it was in broken glass, wino vomit, urine, dog shit. It, it, you're not going to fight on a nice neat mat and you're not going to get somebody to voluntarily to go to the ground for you and there's always broken glass and rocks and you know you, you know what it's like right. fighting with your back on a curb mm -hmm. so um whatever style they choose one get one that's like you say electric eclectic it'll it'll accommodate any situation find an instructor that's willing to teach and knows how to teach there's a lot of people who want to teach the most life, they don't know how to teach. Mm. What they want is they want to be in charge, they want to be the boss, they want everybody to love them mm -hmm. and adore them because they're the... No, find a guy who's dedicated to teaching and making you a better student. That's what it's all about. That's what teaching is. That's what you're about. That's that's why I admire you so much. You know, all the years you've been in it, you've always put the student first. That That's the kind of instructor you want and that's the kind of school you want. We got something out on that. Okay, guys, the back note to listen here, we're talking about MMA. I want you to realize, you know, people look at MMA as mixed martial arts. But to the Kempo stylist, we don't look at MMA as being mixed martial arts. We look at it as being mean martial arts because all the rules go out. In, in the Kempo system, the Kaju Kempo system, where people have, they have that eclectic mentality, there are no rules. So... Finding a good school, one that is going to teach you realistic self-defense is where you're coming from because you don't have chance out on the street. Nobody's going to say, like he said, hey, let's go down and go down on the ground. I mean, you might be going, going down on the ground, but you know, if you're, in, if you're in, a, in a Polynesian community, you can bet your sweet butt. The family is going to be stepping in over there and kicking <laughs> your butt. You see what I mean? So I just want you guys to, uh, to realize that. And uh, I've, I've had a really good time. Uh, talking to Grandmaster over here and you know about his book and you all, you all got the information on it so he already gave it to you we're going to repost it again and again for what um, all the information that you you want and more because of the registration we are using the international Kaju Kembo-IKA.com for people who are interested into getting into our learning university of which people like Grandmaster over here will be invited to do and demonstrate and so that he can be able to promote his way of doing it. His way of doing it now is his way, but by the time that you end up doing it, it's going to be your expression. Mm -hmm. Legacy, it's on Amazon.com. You can get it. And if you do want me to sign it, hey, you have my email address, send it or order it from me, and I'll make sure that you get it. Amazon.com, Legacy. Soon, aloha. Good. Thank you very much for being here. Oh man, it's my pleasure and everything like it. Okay guys, checking out and we'll see you guys later. Aloha.